Uh, we're going to have a talk by uh, Jonas Helsen on fr from uh, Amsterdam uh, on thrifty shadow tomography. So, Jonas, please, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, my apologies for not being there in person. I would have loved to be there, but I, I recently became a father to this uh, delightful little potato here. So it's uh, it's good. it's an online talk for me. Um, with that, um, this is a talk, um, is a work that is joint between me and Michael Walter, who was sort of uh, my postdoc supervisor at the time, but we um, finished this up while I was already at CWI. Um, and yeah, so um, uh, Richard actually announced it perfectly. There was some um, sort of open questions regarding the statistics of, um, of, of, of shadow tomography that they didn't solve. And then we sort of actually sort of inspired by a comment that Richard made at some point, picked this up. Um, and we're going to talk about um, what happens in shadow tomography when you reuse quantum circuits. And then we also have a little sort of um, second result um, on um, bounding um, tails. So as you know, in, in shadow tomography, you need these median of means constructions to make sure you get nice exponential concentration in general. Um, and we were interested in why that is and sort of trying to figure out what the limits of that is. And in both of these scenarios, actually sort of um, algebraically quite interesting things come out. So it's sort of a neat, a neat little set of results. Um, okay, so to, to review um, shadow estimation again, um, this is a, a delightful uh, protocol where you can, um, you get your states and then you can have you can estimate, you know, an ex an exponential number of observable exponential number of observables with respect to the number of samples you get, and you get to do single copy measurements, and everything is nice and happy. Um, and in this talk, I want to really focus on sort of the global Clifford case, or more generally, um, the case where the set of circuits that you're sampling from is a three design. And in that case, the relevant sort of um, restriction on your observables is that they should be bounded in the Hilbert Schmidt norm. Um, so for instance, pure states are a great idea, but in general, the Hilbert Schmidt norm is what gives you the hardness. And then uh, what um, Richard and also Robert Wang and John Preskill did was they proved these really um, remarkable variance bounds, um, which then in, combined, in combination with medians of means estimation gave this really powerful, um, efficient, sort of surprisingly efficient tool. Um, when I saw it, I didn't quite believe that it was supposed to work that way, but it does. So it was very clever. Um, and a key thing that they used to reduce these sort of, oh, let me sort of, you know, for good measure, write the circuit here again, um, but we're going to see a variant of this later. The key thing that you use in order to um, get these variance bounds and reduce them to third moments of the random circuits um, is that you take a random circuit and then you measure it exactly once. And this is incredibly important for the actual sort of mathematics that makes um, the original shadow estimation proposal tick. Um, but if you are an experimentalist, um, you do not like sampling a new circuit every time because, I mean, this has a variety of reasons, but most of it is, is that once you have built a circuit in your quantum computer, it's actually really easy to repeat it usually. This sort of differs by um, types of devices, but in many devices, there's sort of a strong multiplier for you if you have a circuit, you can repeat it. Um, and in fact, if you go look at experimental implementations of, um, of shadow tomography, um, people already do this. They sort of blithely say, oh, we take this, this Clifford circuit and we repeat it 500 times. Um, but strictly speaking, the original proposal doesn't tell you you can do this, um, even though you really should be able to. And this is sort of the problem that we tried to solve. Um, and, you know, for the people that have been around for a long time, they may remember that in 2017, uh, a much younger version of me gave essentially the same talk for a protocol for, called randomized benchmarking, where it turns out that if you um, repeat random circuits, it's actually extremely efficient. Um, and we will see that in, um, in, um, in shadow tomography, this is more or less not the case. So the, the situation is quite different, but it's, it, it, there are some interesting details there. Um, and the key problem technically, um, which sort of, you know, the thing you immediately bump into is that if you try to bound the sort of variance that you get out of your out of your, out of your procedure, if you repeat circuits, is that 
in the, with respect to the circuit set, this be, the variance becomes a fourth moment and not a third moment. And this, you would say, oh, this is easy, but it actually kind of explodes the complexity in all kinds of annoying ways. Um, so for good measure, let me write down what the protocol then looks like. And it really only differs in one particular way in the sense that you apply, you draw a random circuit and then you sort of take your state and apply the unitary and measure and you do this R times uh, for each circuit. And sort of an important technical detail here is that we need at least one random circuit per batch in median of means. Um, you can actually relax this requirement, but it, uh, the mathematics of median of means becomes very tedious. Then, um, in the next version of the paper, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a, an appendix where we sort of work this out. Um, but I don't want to talk about it now because it's very annoying and it doesn't teach you very much. Um, so the key parameter here is this R, and the question is, um, you know, what is the sample complexity with respect to R somehow? Um, and um, there is basically our first main result, which is sort of very general, um, tells you that the sample complexity of sort of R repeat or the variance of R repeat shadow tomography for an arbitrary circuit set, an arbitrary observable, arbitrary state um, looks like one over R times the variance of like single shot um, shadow tomography, which is this, just this regular V. And then some sort of extra constant term that is a little bit mysterious. Um, and this is nothing magical. It's just a law of total variation. Um, there's nothing particularly crazy going on here, um, but you can already see here that there is a bunch of sort of different scenarios. Sort of in the best case scenario, this V star would be zero. Um, in that case, your, um, your VR would be just one over RV, which would mean that um, reusing circuits is sort of maximally efficient. You get the same sampling efficiency you would have otherwise gotten um, but of course, reusing is cheaper than generating new ones. Um, and then there's the other scenario where um, this V star is appreciably big. Um, and in that case, um, you know, you gain nothing from reusing a circuit. Like if this term is really large, then no matter how big you make R, this, this is not going away. This variance is just going to plateau immediately. Um, and it turns out that both of these cases, and this is really the surprising part, it turns out that both of these scenarios show up in incre incredibly natural ways when you try and do um, shadow tomography with repeated circuits, um, sort of in the setting with three design unitaries. So let's go to that sort of, let's go to sort of the next results on that case. And there's a clear dichotomy here. So on the two sides of the dichotomy are four design unitaries and the Clifford group. Um, and on the four design side, it turns out that you basically get maximal reuse efficiency. So if you take a circuit set that is an exact unitary four design, and I'm, I really mean exact here, I'm gonna talk about that in more detail a little bit later, then circuit reuse is maximally effective in the sense that your, your variance of an R circuit reuse is essentially one over R times the original variance, plus some term that is exponentially small in, um, in the number of qubits in your system. Um, and for the people that, you know, are familiar with these kind of techniques, the reason you get an exponentially small term here is essentially because uh, Weingarten calculus gives you these little off diagonal terms. And these are precisely the things that we need to bound here. So this is may even be sort of a technical residue, but I think the scaling is actually real. Uh, and the way you prove this is by writing down the variance as a fourth moment quantity in the unitaries, using that it's a four design, and then, you know, doing a lot of by now reasonably standard Weingarten analysis or Schoel duality, if you wish, to get this sort of small number on the right-hand side. So this is very good, it's very nice. Um, the problem is most of us don't have exact unitary four designs on hand. In fact, I've never actually seen an example of one. Um, and also, you know, when we talk about sort of three design, um, three design shadow tomography, really what we wanna do is shadow tomography with the Clifford group because the Clifford group is easy to implement. And also um, the computational analysis afterwards can often be made efficient. So you would really like this to also be true for the, uh, the Clifford group. And somewhat famously, the Clifford group gracefully fails to be a four design, um, except when you're doing shadow tomography, in which, it, in, in which case it absolutely falls flat on its face. 
Um, so this, this was a big surprise to me because I thought this would just go through for the Clifford group as well. But it turns out that it's very easy to pick um, input states and output observables. In this case, just you pick a stabilizer state, any stabilizer state. And you do sort of shadow tomography with um, with circuit reuse. The circuit reuse is essentially useless. Um, sort of the, um, the 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 VR, the variance of this R repeat bit itself is two. It's a constant. Um, it doesn't scale with R as all at all. Which means that you know the best R to choose is um, is one. You you like if you and this is this is for the experimentalists in the room. If you're doing shadow tomography with the global Clifford group, you should not repeat circuits. You're just wasting your time um, because you gain you gain nothing. Um, maybe there is some states where it is the case, but generically, this is sort of what you get. Um, and um, this proving this is sort of morally the same as this thing on the left hand side. It's a little bit harder because um, the Clifford group is not a four design, so you have to use um, the Sherwell duality for the Clifford group. Um, luckily, I, I, I you know, worked with one of the people that invented this sure wild duality. So Michal and David Gross and Sebek and Azami had a really nice paper a few years ago where they worked out basically this entire duality theory, which allows you to do this calculation. It's fairly tedious, uh, but it's possible. And it tells you that this, this number is just two. There's extra degrees of freedom in the commutant that do not disappear. They're not exponentially small. So... You know, this is very annoying because you would really like to keep on using Cliffords. Um, so, so, but, and then, you know, and importantly, um, this analysis here, this exact unitary four design, because the um, inverse frame operator gen generically scales exponentially with the number of qubits, like the numbers are really large, you would need to use either a multiplicative four design or an exact four design, which is hard to do. Um, before this result kicks in. So you can't just plug in an approximate for design and have it work. Um, so what we did was a little bit more of a tailor made analysis where we um, borrowed this really beautiful construction from Jonas Haferkamp and friends, um, and then sort of, you know, went through the nuts and bolts of their analysis um, to sort of improve all the constants and actually got some really nice, a really nice interpolation theorem uh, where we show that if you do, um, shadow tomography with circuit reuses with a circuit set that sort of interpolates between an arbitrary like an, an arbitrary for a for design and the Clifford group by taking a random Clifford and then a T gate and then a random Clifford and then a T gate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the variance actually converges to the for design case much faster than you would expect based on the design properties of this thing itself. So if you just plug in the design properties, because it's sort of an approximate for design at least, um, you would get something that scales pretty poorly. Uh, again, because of these big um, exponential factors everywhere. But if you do the analysis, again, using the Clifford Sherwell duality, and then some really tedious, and this was sort of the sweaty part of the paper, some really tedious and complicated spectral perturbation theory. Um, you, yeah, you see here that there is a, you know, three fourths plus O to the two to the minus N inside this k getting this exponentially small factor inside the k is very annoying um, but you can read the paper about this if you if you want to know the details um, it's it's not very pleasant but it works and what this shows you is that you can get you can get you know by making this circuit you know a little bit longer you can get exponentially you can get close exponentially quickly to making this term very small because for n large enough this is you know smaller than one so this whole term drops down very quickly. So in practice, what this means, if you have, if you want to do shadow tomography with a three design, um, it's worth spending a little bit of T gates and a little bit of complexity so that you can reuse circuits much more efficiently. Um, now, where the optimal point here is depends quite strongly on how difficult it is to resample circuits and how difficult your classical calculations are and what your sort of, you know, personal priors on experimental difficulty versus um, statistical difficulty are. But, you know, there's a clean interpolation result here, um, which, you know, I thought I thought was kind of neat. Um, and that's sort of it on the reuse side. So what we have is that circuit reuse has a very ambiguous advantages. For four designs, it works perfectly. For Clifford's, it works not at all. And then there's sort of a really beautiful 
interpolation. And the way you prove this is through moment analysis and some, some rather annoying perturbation theory. Okay, back to median of means. I, I talked about it earlier, um, but if you wanna do shadow tomography, especially when you do three design shadow tomography, you need to plug in this annoying feature of the estimator, which is called the median of means estimator, which essentially gives you nice exponential tails on your um, on your on your empirical estimators of the means. Um, and the first thing you think about is, hey, do I really need to do that? Because that's very annoying. I really want to just use an empirical mean. Um, and it turns out that for if you use local Cliffords or match gates, people have found out that this can actually be removed. Um, but the reason for this sort of removal ability is basically because the resulting distributions in these cases are actually bounded. So you can use regular hoofding inequalities to get exponential concentration. But for the Clifford, for the three design gate sets, this is not true because the distributions you're sampling from are genuinely unbound, like the estimators are genuinely unbound, the random variables are genuinely unbounded in size, in the sense that they can be of size two to the n. So it's not clear that you can sort of put a nice um, tail around this and not ha have to deal with secret ex exponential explosions everywhere. Um, so we sort of said, okay, can we go through this the hard way? And can we remove this in the three design case? Um, and again, it turns out that if you are exactly har random, and in this case, we really need sort of you know strong high randomness, or at least a multiplicative n design where n is the number of qubits. You do not need median of means. You can do sort of direct um, hoofding tail bound analysis, and in fact, get this really nice by um, you know rather tedious bounding of the uh, exponential generating function of the random variable that comes out of shadow tomography. And then a whole bunch of sure wild duality and Weingarten calculus, you can actually put a really neat sort of exponential tail bound around these random variables. So you can just use an empirical estimator. The problem is no one has time for n designs. You would really like is to be true for the multi cubic Clifford group, again because this is an easy fun group. And here it turns out that you do actually absolutely need median of meets. And I think you know Richard and friends already knew this; they just didn't write it down. Um, and we went to the you know rather annoying bother of actually proving all of it. Um, it was very interesting. Turns out what happens is that the distributions that come out of Clifford shadow tomography are morally at least heavy tailed. They can't be really heavy tailed because they're still bounded distributions. It's just that the 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 interval scales exponentially with the number of qubits. Um, but sort of in the limit of n going to infinity, you can make a really neat statement which tells you that the um, the moments of this distribution grow um, not exponentially, but super exponentially. They grow as two to the m squared, or m is the moment. Um, and this tells you that the exponential generating function does not converge. It has conver conver convergence rate zero. In fact, it's not even clear if this limiting random variable actually exists. This is sort of annoying. But this moment analysis is enough to tell you that you actually really do need median of means. Otherwise, like with a regular empirical estimator, you cannot get exponential concentration. So here we get another sort of um, dichotomy. And here we don't have an interpolation result because the requirement on this high randomness is much stronger. You really need like a sort of an almost exact end design. And it's not clear if we can generate this in any useful way. All right, so what's the conclusion? Um, if you're an experimentalist, what you can take away here is you can reuse circuits in shadow estimation. So go ahead. Um, just don't use any Cliffords. Um, be careful. Um, use our interpolation set or you know, bite the bullet and resample your circuits. Um, you know, I think these homeopathic circuits are really nice. They're very clever. Um, but I think we should use them more often and they're very powerful here. Um, the median of means can also be removed from the estimation procedure. So this is, I, I thought this was somewhat surprising. You can do this if you're high random. This is something like a like a Levy's lemma type concentration result, although it doesn't follow directly from Levy's lemma. You have to be a little bit more careful because again, shadow tomography is not a Lipschitz continuous function, or at least the Lipschitz constant scales exponentially with n. So it's sort of annoying everywhere. The Clifford's on the other side, it just goes nowhere. The nth moment grows as two to the n squared. And you know, it's not even clear if this sort of like limiting random variable properly exists. This is something that I want to investigate further. Um, and then there's sort of obvious other open questions. Like, can you do circuit repeating for the match gates 
Is it worth it for local Cliffords? Um, these are questions that we don't have formal answers to, although we have suspicions. I would really like to find out what the efficiency is of log depth circuits, as we saw in the previous talk. But there we don't even really know the third moment. So the fourth moment is probably even harder. Um, and then it's sort of interesting that there is an observe a non-trivial state observable dependence of this variance, which is not really present in the third moment, because there the like the overlaps are sort of very simple. And in the fourth moment, it gets a little bit more complicated. So you might have scenarios where you are actually good with reusing Clifford's, um, but only for specific states and observables. And it's not clear what the limits of that is. Um, so with that, I am going to conclude. And uh, not to steal uh, Richard's thunder, because he gave a really great talk, um, but we are also hiring. So if you want to come work in Amsterdam, ah, there he goes. If you want to come work in Amsterdam on shadows or other things, I'm looking for postdocs. I'm looking for PhD students. Drop me a line. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the very nice talk, Jonas. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, so one right in the middle there. Might be difficult to get there, so maybe another question that is more easily reached before that one. I mean, th that, that guy in the middle with the white t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Martin? Yeah. Where, where you? Where you? Yes. Oh. Hey, Jonas, thanks for the nice talk. Um, hey, hello, thanks. Uh, yeah, you showed this worst case result where you put in a random st uh, some some stabilizer state and use yeah. also the stabilizer state to construct the observable. Mm -hmm. So this is a very specific example where you get this worst case behavior, but maybe yeah. when you randomize like one of them just a little bit, uh, may maybe this completely goes away. Can can you comment on that? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I um, yes, I would think so. So I think in this in in. In the typical in the typical state sense of the earlier talk and, and also in your paper, I think um, there I think it would go away because I think also the fourth moment is going to collapse to a second moment. Um, although maybe it doesn't do that. That's actually an interesting question. Um, I don't know. Um, it's worth investigating. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I see. So when this would go away like very quickly, then maybe th th this annoyance that you found that doesn't matter as much. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm trying I'm actually I'm trying to, to do the calculation in my head now. Um, I think what I said is wrong. I don't think it becomes a second moment quantity because you're averaging now over two copies of the state, so you would get some extra diagram there that you need to contract, and it would contract non-trivially. And it's not clear that this becomes a small number. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'll think about it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'd like to point that we know that there's a whiteboard behind you, so if you want to do the calculation now, it's also... <laughs> you know, yeah, I'll just uh, crawl through the screen. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> so, next question, please. What about now? Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for the talk. It's really cool. I was wondering thank about the, um, the homeopathic thing. So you're introducing mm -hmm. T-gates in between Clifford gates, right? Yeah. I understood that correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's going yeah. to start becoming a, a universal circuit, right? Uh, yes, very quickly. Yeah, so I'm wondering whether this um, improvement that you get by introducing those T-gates, if you're somehow offloading that to the classical simulation that you need to carry out afterwards to sort of compute the inverse channel? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, um, and not quite, yes. So, but it turns out that the scaling works out really nice. I didn't, I should have, I should have put this on the slide, actually. Um, because the K is an exponent, like you get sort of, the, the the extra variance term decreases exponentially with the number of T gates um, and sort of the complexity of doing simulations with these homeopathic circuits by say a uh, stabilizer extent simulator also roughly increases exponentially with the number of T gates. And these two things sort of balance out. And in practice, you get that the computational complexity increases polynomially with the error that you want to make, sort of roughly as one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is the bit of variance that you put. So you put, you know, uh, um, how many, what your optimal repeat number is, you calculate what the resulting variance error should be, which is sort of a constant relation. And then you realize that the computational complexity cost you incur is actually inverse exponential, inverse polynomial in this epsilon. I see. Um, so it's not- so it's Because like they're both exponentials, it's actually rather benign. Oh, right, but right. this is so, absolutely true. So sorry. So but, but okay. So so you're not getting an advantage necessarily from repeating. It's just that you can repeat and not really lose anything in the process. Is that right? 
Because you're like, okay. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, so, so I, I was under the impression that you would gain some advantage from repeating, but what you're saying is that you're allowed to repeat without incurring in any penalty. You just need to. Uh... Yes, so if you want to. So, I mean, okay, so all of this is written from the perspective of someone who has a cost function where um, a repeat sample is much cheaper than a new circuit sample. Uh, okay. um, and if you make that formal thing, we're sort of saying, okay, a circuit is alpha times more expensive than a repeat sample, um, then you would want your um, repeat variance to be roughly one over alpha. Um, and you can attain that by choosing your um, circuit depth in the number of T gates to be roughly one over alpha squared. All right. Um, okay, I see. Thank you very much. So Thank that's you. that's sort of the, the the series of steps that you need to do. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a bit tedious that you have to know in advance how annoyed you are by um, number, how annoyed you, what your ratio, what is your ratio of T gate annoyance to circuit reuse annoyance? That what that's what you need to figure out. And once you know that, then we have an optimal formula for you. All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we had time for. So let's thank uh, Jonas and also the other speakers of the session again. Yeah, okay, so see you all after lunch. All right, bye-bye, everyone. Has anyone seen, does anyone? Hi, uh, does anyone, uh, is the first speaker here? You still, ah, yeah, okay.